I'd like to think that I'm good at understanding games, and for the most part I am. I'm pretty good at reading between the lines for the game's themes and messages where other people aren't. I mean, I made a 45 minute Last of Us Part 2 video, so I can understand stuff like that pretty well. Disco Elysium has so many things that I just do not understand. I guess I should start by introducing the game. Disco Elysium is a western detective RPG that came out back in 2019 to good reviews, but since then has gotten even more praise with the release of the final cut, and like the title states, is incredible. Instead of diving right into its complexity, allow me to talk about everything else. The premise of the game is that you're a drunken cop who's lost his memory, and you're trying to solve the mystery of a hanged man behind the hotel with your partner. The goal of solving a murder is an easy and effective way of getting you invested right away. It gives you a base purpose so that everywhere you go you can try and learn more about what happened. And the setting is so unique. It's not a big city or an old ship, it's a dystopian decrepit town with a bunch of assholes. But walking around and exploring this place is so interesting. There's something to be said about every sign and mailbox, the history of Revishal is so thought out, and the sad horn plays wherever you go. I can't remember the last time an environment has gotten me so immersed. Everything about the area is broken and dirty, it's like nowhere you've ever been before, and all the characters are so realized. The way the entire game is formatted is like an interactable mystery novel. You can click on so many things and your thoughts will narrate what you're thinking, and when you talk to people what they say appears in the text box as the voice actors read the lines. And all of them are so good. Video games have a really bad reputation for having terrible voice acting, and for good reason, because a lot of it is really shit. I have no idea why. For so many of the performances I've seen, you have to try to do this bad. Most people I know could probably do better than this shit. That's right, we all have that attitude. The train will be rolling in no time, let's do it. But for Disco Elysium, they hired the best of the best. Just through dialogue, without the character even moving, they make me care and feel so much for them. And the storybook narration of their facial expressions and nuances makes it all so believable. I love good character work in games, and sometimes after I read a narration, I'll involuntarily physically react how I think my character would in that situation. It's all so immersive. It makes listening to all the dialogue so much more bearable. And I mean, there is a lot of dialogue. Holy shit, these people have a lot to say. For each person, there's about six options, so much take you to even more. So the highest compliment I can give is that I listen attentively to all of it because of the performances. There's also a lot of options to shift your relationship with people, so you have to be careful about what you pick. Some of them are even reliant to these checks you have to pass. These checks are my first kind of critique. For the most part, I really like them. How they work is that there are these little skill checks that can progress your relationship, quest, or even the information you need for the story. Each check has a percentage of success based on your stats. Red checks can only be done once. If you succeed, that's great, but if you fail, it can really fuck your shit up. One time I failed a red check, and I straight up said to this girl, You're black. That shit was so tragic. She was so nice to me too, and then I messed it all up. You can redo white checks though. If you fail it at first, you can either gather more information to increase the percentage, or you can upgrade that stat. The whole idea of these checks are pretty cool, but where I find an issue is that if you fail and can't upgrade that stat anymore, you can be completely locked out of parts of the game. And at the start, this isn't too big of a deal. The first part of the game is actually one of my favorite parts. You're running around Revishal, questioning people, going from one place to another. Each time you get a new piece of information, you go to somebody else. This is my favorite part of these mystery solving games. The constant sense of discovery and that you're getting closer and closer to the answer with each passing second. And the size of the town makes it so that you get familiar with it quickly. The first two days are exhilarating and you spend morning to night solving the murder, but then you kinda reach this roadblock when you get to Titus. I got every piece of information and maxed out the authority stat, but then I failed the check, so what the fuck do I do now? Luckily that's when the waterlock opened up the other half of the map, so I was able to go to a whole new area to re-experience what I felt before. This new half of the map feels so much more empty and sadder than last. When you're walking along the coast, this ethereal track plays that feels so harrowing and existential. There's this broken down fishing village with just a few people living in it, and at one point I had an optional task from a slimy businessman to get the people's permission to start the construction of a youth center. Which seemed good, but the real reason you wanted to build it was to drive them out of the area with the noise. And again, parts like these all come back to the writing performances. The people here felt so lonely, but at the same time so hopeful and kind that I couldn't get their signatures. Even though it meant probably being able to progress the story further, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Many scenarios and situations cause you to battle with your own morals to get certain things done, and whether it's worth it to solve something. The way you feel towards the characters is one of the best parts about the game. As you make your way further down the coast, it's even more desolate, discovering the ruins of the revolution as well as the broken down church. 
You do things involving the hangman a bit, but then you're put into starting a completely different main quest, which is starting the club slash researching the hole in the universe. Don't get me wrong, I very much enjoyed this whole quest, but when I was running out of things to do and a whole other area came up, this needs to be the moment where it drops a huge twist on the case or something and gets the ball rolling again. But instead it has me start a whole other story regarding things at first I don't really care about. Now I'm sure the quest did have major implications on the themes and messages of the game, but as I stated before, I don't really know what those are. And even while doing this quest I ended up getting locked out of it because I failed the white check again. So now pretty much every quest is locked out behind a white check. I think the idea of the checks that if you fail it you have to upgrade or find out more information is cool, but the trade off is that there's a chance that you get locked out of a quest line or have to do a bunch of specific steps to get it back. I think a way that could have helped this is having the checks reset every day or every other day or something, so that in the morning you have some new chances to start the day. This may also cause the player to stumble across the solution while talking to people to pass the time. But since this wasn't an option, there was only one solution to solve a problem like this. The internet. So for the next couple of hours or so, I had Bing AI pulled up answering every question I had to complete my quest. Little tip for this game, do not be afraid to use AI when you're stuck, and also don't be afraid to make a quick save before doing important white checks so that you aren't locked out. So after using Bing to get past some points I was stuck on, like how we needed to buy the $25 board game at the bookstore to use the dice inside to get another try at Titus, I was back on track. I found my love for the game once more by running around pursuing leads, getting people to talk so I can check out another place, discovering new information, and along the way, you get even closer to the characters. Titus, who at first seems like a gruff asshole, just wants to take care of his people. Class J is charming on the outside, but you come to understand that she's just as broken as everyone else here. Kim Kitsuragi, your partner, became one of my favorite characters in gaming. The way you go to love him is similar to how you did to Arthur Morgan. At first you appreciate their humbleness and soft-spoken nature, and as it goes on you become more attached to the personalities and nuances. If no one's got me, I know Kim's got me. Then after making great progress on the case in the village, I came back to the Whirling and Rags to find a standoff happening. This is the most intense part of the game. Standing in between the soldiers and the Hardy Boys, you know that at any moment these lunatics could start shooting at you. The mechanic of choosing dialogue options comes into full swing here while I tried my best to pick every option that could possibly calm the situation down. But no matter what I did, it didn't help. So once they started shooting, I held my breath during every dice roll, praying that I saw green. It was so nerve wracking as I sat there not being able to do anything but hope that nobody I cared about got shot. Until I got hit and passed out. When you wake up after the madness, you're relieved that you and Kim are okay. There's a feeling of grief mixed with hope. Ravishal seems so dead but peaceful. Most of the important characters have left. Now, for the last leg of the game, you're determined to find out who killed the hanged man once and for all. This ending part is my favorite part. There's no other side quests to do, there's no favors, there's not a big strike going on. You're just trying to solve the mystery. As you ride your boat over to the island, you know that the main conflict has passed and now all you have left to do is end it. And once you find out who did, it's great. While you're talking to the old man, the game kind of narrates exactly what you're thinking, that you finally have him, there's no way you can fuck up now. And once you find out everything you need to know, you turn him in, you get to keep your job, and you recruit Kim to your precinct. It's a very satisfying conclusion to the long journey this game took me on. Now that we've gotten everything else out of the way, it's time to talk about what I've been waiting to talk about from the start. This game is not afraid to talk about shit that the average person will not understand at all. The world that you play in is kind of an alternate dystopian reality of Earth, and there is so much history to it. There are things and characters who will just lay out the entire thousand year timeline with no simplifications. Straight up reading word for word out of the experts encyclopedia. And history isn't the only thing. There is tons of commentary on politics and stuff. I tried paying attention and grasping most of it, but it was when I was on top of the statue and talking to the responsibility people, a side quest I was already confused about, but now there's all these prompts about communism and stuff, and I, I just couldn't anymore. I had no idea what they were talking about. I'm sure it was important, but I'm not sure what anyone was talking about. There's some other stuff too, like the explanation of Pale on the phasma at the end. When that popped up, my mind was blown because I obviously didn't expect that. The interaction is mostly super cool, but there's some really cryptic stuff that I knew probably fit in with some themes, but I was not picking up on it. The shortest breakdown for this game is over an hour long. Disco Elysium does not seem to care about if people pick up on what it's trying to tell you or not. 
which is okay. You don't have to make a communism for dummies course every time you try and talk about it, but making such a complex experience comes at the cost of losing a lot of people, especially when it's done like this. Disco Elysium is a confusing game with a lot of confusing themes, those of which I could not name because I don't know what they are, which is a personal flaw for me because I'm not the type of person to pick up on these types of things. But even with all this crazy commentary, it still somehow makes a really immersive existential experience from beginning to end. I think I need to mention how hard it is to make a really good RPG like this with characters and events I actually care about. Too many of them forget that there's people other than traditional RPG fans who played every Final Fantasy who want to play their games. And this one, for the most part, made it really easy to get into and keep playing. The atmosphere and design are so perfected. The story, while confusing at times, is really engaging, even when you're doing things like setting up a nightclub. With an experience as big as this one, with this many things to say, there's bound to be some flaws. But all in all, it is an incredible game, and I hope they win their lawsuit to make the sequel. Disco Elysium gets an A-. Ooh.